this to you. Everybody already knows it. So all the people here, I imagine, already know this due to the fact that you're here and therefore switched on. Whereas, okay, so we're going to talk about exams. 4th of June, uh, 9.45. Okay. All right. So, what quiz from last time? You're suffering from the two time constraints that need to get forward to the evaluation of 20 people. Okay, so how would we actually work? If we were planning this, how would we, what would we choose? How would we go about getting this information? Yeah? Surveys. Surveys? But, okay, so think about surveys. For 20 people, how much time do you think you're going to need to actually prepare a good survey and then to distribute it and get the data back? So they want to, so they want to kind of, uh, yes, they, they want to uh, satisfy the person who is uh, the interviewer, who's, or not interviewer, who's running the focus group. Okay, that's one reason, yeah? Yeah, they might end up in a lot of thinking the same way. Yes, they might all end up thinking the same way. Is it often that they all really end up thinking the same way? You can do get group through that can happen. But what other one, what, what else might it be? Yeah. The person with the loudest voice. Yes. So the person with the loudest voice might have the most influence too. Anything else? A bit more stupid.
So it's bad because um, you know you uh, you might not you might not estimate as much time as is required. It also means that you're more likely to think that you can do everything. You can uh, you know over promise everything that you can do. Okay? Um, because we're optimistic about our skill set, but also we're just optimistic in general because we create this thing. Okay, what's the second system effect? So the second system effect is that in the first system, because you don't quite know what you're doing, you keep everything tight. Okay? So you do what is required to get the job done, keep the interface tight, etc. But you get, over that first system, you get lots of change requests or lots of requests for addition. And in the second system, the tendency is to just do everything without even thinking about it. Just put everything in that, that people have said they wanted. And that blows the system and the interface into some kind of nightmare scenario. Yeah. Yeah, there's Emotional attachment to your products or to your interfaces isn't necessarily logical. Okay? It's not necessarily logical, it's quite subjective, it's not necessarily testable directly. So that's what you need to think about. That's what we need to do. That's what we're trying to get into. So um, the first time we delivered this course, we all went up to the Manchester City Art Gallery and everybody had a special tour around all the different kind of types of art where they had to uh, express what they wanted about it. Um, so that didn't happen last year, mainly because um, we didn't have enough time. This year again, we've not really had enough time either. So what I want to know is, would you rather have an industrial lecture, like we're going to get this afternoon, or would you rather hoof up to the Art Manchester City Art Gallery and uh, have a tour around the art and talk about it to artists who have been brought in to talk to you about beauty, aesthetics and artistic experience? I'll have you know that this is the first because it's the only field trip that's ever been run in computer science. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, we went for a curry at this and that, which was awesome. Okay, so who would rather have an industrial lecture as opposed to 
Manchester City Art Gallery anyway, they wander around. You must all do that all the time, surely, anyway. High-minded high intellectuals must be going to Manchester City Art Gallery all the time. Okay, but... Um, okay, so maybe that's something we'll do next year. Then. Uh, the so, it's very, it's a very strange thing, effective experience, very strange thing in emotions, because it's very difficult to understand how they affect everything. So, how is it that some people love the Metro UI and some people hate the Metro UI? Yes. So some people don't like the change, that's true, yeah, they don't like the change in systems. Anything else? Some people love Microsoft, some people hate it. Some people love Microsoft. Yeah, then there's more to More to this. <laughs> well, I think uh, if that's the yeah, case. People work for Microsoft, maybe. Say again? People work for Microsoft. People who work for Microsoft. Well, I'm gonna say if students like Microsoft, I mean I could probably arrange some counselling courses after the <laughs> event and then obviously we've got some issues. Um, yeah.
Because lots of people say that intuition, intuitive interface is certainly a thing, right? Intuitive interface is very oh yes, intuition, you know, yes, we all always intuitive intuitive interfaces. But when you actually look at the, the background in cognitics, I think that probably Jeff Ashley's right. I think that there isn't an intuitive way. It's just that we we've learned to do that. Uh, you know, just like we, we all think that agreement is not in your head and disagreement is shaking your head, but that's not the case in all cultures. So what's intuitive and what's not? Personal satisfaction, memories. Okay, so you could actually have something that's really behaviorally good. Okay, so we might say that we love Metro UI because behaviorally we love it, the way it behaves is really good. Or viscerally, we love the way it looks or we hate the way it looks. Reflectively, we might think, well, I don't want to be associated with um, because my self image is such that I don't want to be associated with Microsoft, I want to be associated with. Apple are cool, and all designers have Apple. Apple, so all designers have Apple, and I have Apple. I'm as cool as a designer, you know, or something, etc. Okay, so that's that's something that we need that you need to think about. What is there's also there's a message contained in all of this. Okay, does that make sense to you guys? Have you come across these before? Reflective, uh, visual, and behavioural kinds of stuff. No. Where have you come across them before? Uh, graphic design. Graphic design, okay. So when did you do graphic design? Were you doing graphic design? Uh, A-level. A-level, cool. Excellent. Okay, you should come up here. You probably know more than me. Come on. Right. So is that the UI is more UI than HDI? Well, okay, so... So the UX, we don't really know what it is, right? In some ways. We know from the first from the first lecture that there's lots of disagreement or lots of, yeah, lots of disagreement about, kind of about what UX is, etc. We know that UX design, UXD, is often associated with graphic design, okay, with visuals as opposed to anything else. Of course, when I say, when I say UXD, you mostly aren't thinking about sound, you're not thinking about audio, you're not thinking about any of the other senses, it's mostly visual design, okay, UXD. But UX in general, is this idea of kind of, quanti of quali qualitative, subjective work mushed up with the more quantitative, HCI, objective, generalizing work. Okay. So if we say new X, then this is, I think this is new X, but if you say new XD, yeah, it, some of it actually is new XD. And if I wanted, I mean, the designers who designed um, this, you know, the font designers are actual graphic designers. They're not. They design fonts. They don't do computer science directly. The people who, did, who design the layout, etc., they're graphic designers. Okay. The way that the interactions work, they're you and experienced people, not, not interact, they're interaction people. Okay. They're not graphic designers. So you, you need a team. And most, in most cases, for large organizations doing this work, you will need to manage a team of different people because there's too many different stakeholders in the design process. You've got graphic designers, they're experienced designers, auditory designers. Okay, if you go to the BBC, there's lots of different kinds of designers there. Okay. okay. So beauty. Beauty is a very difficult thing to think about. Some of it's based on symmetry or asymmetry. Okay, so you know some cultures like symmetry facial symmetry, etc. For other people, other cultures like asymmetry. So in Japan, you don't, there's very little that's going to be symmetrical. Most of it's asymmetrical, okay, for the way that their aesthetic works. Um, so it presupposes that there is some learned behavior. Okay, it's not intuitive because concepts of beauty differ in different cultures and different locations. So you need to think about what you might think is obviously beautiful might not be obviously beautiful for others. In fact, the interesting thing here is that there was um, a survey conducted um, where people were asked the question, what's your favourite colour? What's your favourite kind of um, art? To have this, this, you know, as we have user-centred design and cooperative evaluation, these guys wanted user-centred art, cooperative art design. Okay? And so they asked people, what's their favourite colours? What's, you know, tell me all about your favourite beautiful items. And they tried to make a mishmash of this. They tried to put all of this good stuff into a particular um, uh, into a particular art display. Okay. And overall, everybody who came to see it hated it. Even the people who had suggested these were their favourite colours, these were their favourite kind of beautiful things, these were their favourite artistic 
styles, they had to be Jesus centered. Beauty, and it was whole. Everybody hated it. Okay. So that tells us, it seems to me, that when we want design, we're not looking for at least design and graphic, in the way of graphic design, the way of art. We're not looking for the user centered approach directly. We're looking for somebody to take take the lead, take the reins, give us their vision. Now that vision might not might be liked by many people, or it might not be liked, it might be liked by many people, not liked by many people, but it's very difficult to design it properly. Because all you get is some kind of um, sort of mediocre mush. So what I would suggest is when you're thinking about design, when you're thinking about beauty and design in the context of your interfaces, it's often a good idea create new interfaces, new interactions, to actually do this in a way that is, um, that has vision, okay, so that it, you let the graphic designers, you let the artists do what they should do, and you take as little, um, you do as little about that as possible, okay, because that's how you get by it, because there's lots of other things in with regard to effective for computing, emotional responses to things, there's lots of other stuff that comes into play, not just the beauty of it, but whether people buy into the brand, whether people buy into the interaction, yes. Yeah, so that means gamification, It could be linked to the gamification, yeah. I mean, you could link those two aspects together, because obviously, you know, gamification relies on certain expectations, but also novelty. And sometimes that novelty means that if you do it, if, if users can think of it, it's not novel, right? If, if users can think, oh, the other thing that looks like the iPad, the iPod, when it first came out, nobody would want it particularly, because we all know what it would, it would have been designed. As it was, but it had somebody's vision where you've got the circular selector, you know, the donut. That, that was awesome. Yeah. But it's not really what it was to see before. Um, the other thing is that this also could also link this to ethics, to link or link and also link it to training and stakeholders <coughs> in regard to ethics. Because you can think to yourself, well, actually, here, I should let, I'm not an expert. Kind of design. So I should let the experts do the design. So if you've got graphic designers, you've got artists, then you should let them do the design because they're the specialists. They know the background. They might, you know, they might know of the uh, well, know, the grid system. So the grid system, you must know the grid system. Yeah. Yeah. So the grid system, but very few people do know the grid system. They don't know its, you know, its 1930s heritage uh, from uh, 1930s Germany and Austria. They very little idea of how you could have this, this design working. Okay. So, well, so therefore, graphic designers do know that because they're trained in it. That's where they are. So you need to make use of their training. Okay. If you want to go on the wall that will fit everybody, this is it. Have nothing in your house that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. I'd say this is the same for interaction design. I'd say this is the interaction design. It should be useful. Going there, and if you think it's beautiful, if you think that it looks good in this way, I think this is more autobiographical design. You know, we were talking about autobiographical building autobiographical uh, interfaces or interactions. I think interaction wise, you need to talk to people, but beauty, emotion, it's so subjective that you might as well just try your autobiographical design for. Attitudes. We could link attitudes. 
can you add these? You could, you could tie this back to phonology if you wanted to. You could tie this back to the work with the Cockney uh, rhyming song ATM. Okay, because that's trying to say you're, we're all part of the same group, so we couldn't use our ATM because we're part of your group. And the situation that these people are using. So then, there's these other two. Diachroma and intercroma. And the diachroma is about evolution of things like biology, culture. But we also have things that, so this is about the self, the person, the individual. Whereas this is about the culture, about the society. So this is about groups. And this is about individuals. Okay. So you need to take these things into account, or at least think about them, when you're thinking about how people will react to ethics, to the, uh, ethics, the aesthetics. So we have to decide how we're going to do our design. So the bottom-up models of visual attention suggest that low-level salient features such as contrast, size, shape, colour, and brightness highlight well with visual interest. Okay. So, for instance, a red apple in a picture is going to attract your attention. A face in a picture is going to attract your attention. Probably more than the red apple, actually, because that's what we get. The horizon line. So how can you think about these um, low level, this low level stuff, the contrast, the sound, the shape, the colour, the brightness, the luminosity of something? How can you use that to attract people's attention to things? What you might want to do is try to predict what actions are required next and highlight those actions in some way. But we also know that they have to be a certain shape, a certain colour, a certain size. On the other hand, explain visual search driven, um, visual search driven by semantics of the knowledge of the environment. Okay? So here we are, when asked to describe the emotion of the person in the picture, the emotion of the person, what, not just that, they're, that here's the face, it's face recognition, but what does that person actually, is that, are they happy or are they sad? Okay? So it's more complex, there's more semantics involved. is that it's really likely to be a combination of these two kinds of models. Now, the reason why I'm going slightly faster than normally is because there's a bit that's in the slides after coffee, but I still want to get to that bit because it's, it's, I think it's quite interesting, before we have the break. So, on effective computing, the detection of emotion Effective emotion, effective and ex effective experience that I'm talking about now is different to what's called effective computing. So effective experience is about emotional experience. Okay. Effective computing is about the ability of computers to express emotion and in some cases um, actually have emotions in some form. And this is very much research. Yeah, you should be looking at this. This is a research work that's been Emotions, theoretically, even if I'm a computer scientist. Um, so, this work is, is really research based work. And this is mainly put forward by, um, there's actually a, a journal now, um, All On Effective Computing, it's an electrical transactions journal, a research journal. But it's actually put, mainly put forward by um, a researcher called uh, Rosalind Picard at MIT, who has this effective computing group and does a lot of effective computing. Work where she proposes, and there's a set of people working towards this, she proposes that, um, that computers can recognize and then express and actually have emotions. That's what 
these two aren't the same thing. What I'm talking about is how you can use effective and emotional, understanding of emotion and emotional experiences to better create software. Okay. I'm not expecting that you're, that when I use the term effective, I'm not expecting to talk about this kind of effective computing, where I'm expecting your computer, you know, you to be uh, creating systems which actually have emotional experiences. Um, who, obviously, you all listen to who's read Zen and the Automatic Circle Maintenance? You started? So there was an announcement that there was uh, uh, some work done um, in the UK whereby um, people, whereby a computer could recognise the, um, could do gaze recognition, recognise the emotions of somebody's face quite straightforward, quite accurately. And that then that this linked up to, um, obviously going back to this, to this on the Today program, uh, then linked up to um, artificial intelligence might have this understanding of emotion linked with artificial intelligence, which might give you this ability to have some kind of emotion. Okay? So, while it does sound kind of weird, and it's not actually anywhere near, it still, it still is, you know, it's still sort of people working on this, and um, if you wanted to, to link, this in the, uh, link this together in your creativity part, your exam So there is a reason to be, you might be thinking as computer scientists, oh, screw that, we don't care about it. As long as it doesn't work, that's fine. But there is a possible, there is a reason why we want to do this, because we want the aesthetics to be good so that we get better trust in the applications. Okay. Yeah. There is a famous exception to this rule, the Drudge Report. It's yeah. absolutely horrible. Yeah. It's disgusting. Yes. It's terrible to look at, but it makes you, you know, it's 
it's almost like a marketing ploy. Yeah. Like, I'm going to put a crack website. Yeah, that's it. Oh, yeah, that's useful. A nice uh, North Korean thing. So, uh, on mobile, uh, you can see on mobile that uh, just showed that around. But it's me riding a rocket uh, <laughs> on a rocket launcher. <laughs> One thing that you know, you say it looks amateurish at the start, but once you start using it, it looks like it's okay. And you might be, to a certain extent, might be good. Anybody else? Yeah. We're seeing a, a private website, but there is no information about registrants' websites. But if they're worse, and that's why people go to this. Okay, but this is just a car leasing yeah. site. So I mean, car leasing sites, it's you know, you can get. I've been to car leasing sites, and they they don't look like this. They they look corporate, you know, but they're not purple. With <laughs> okay, so I've been thinking about this and I, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while. I was thinking about the discussions that were had at about how this breaks were user experience at HCI conferences. And, you know, when this first came out, it was the hot topic of discussion at this you know, when you're in the bar after a hard day talking and you then talk some more about this, and, you know, it's just crazy. Like, yes, God. Might be. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that people like the underdog and they like to be different. Yeah, that's true. So I think that what I've created is uh, what I think is that there's this other pr there's this principle which isn't really used in the US at all. And I think it's what I'm calling the king principle for all of this stuff. Personality. You're buying into personality, and that personality might be whatever, but you're buying into that personality. So here we're buying into some fun-loving, kind of weird person who is doing all these, these car stuff, but you're buying into it because it's personal. You know it's about her. You know that she's there all the time, because she is. Um, you can even contact her online through this kind of messaging, uh, just here, where it's actually really her. Um, and a real, and a real <coughs> um, so that kind of thing, I think, is more important. And the reason why you get corporate problems, problems with corporate sites, is there's no personality. It's designed by a load of people who, you know, it's just a corporate entity. So there's no trust. You get less trust you know, by the fact it's not personal. Now, people can disagree, but I, um, the more I see this, the more I'm convinced that the key principle of all of this stuff is personality of the, in the interface, personality of the experience, yes. Kind of like the same reason people vote for the person who can't see my experience, but has a personality. Yeah, yeah. So the people who, that's right, so, you know, it's people who, the people who you can't see, but they've got a good personality, they're not, you know, they're, they're trying and they're into it. Probably better than the people who can see, but have got bad personality, but, you know, are obviously got bad personality in some sort of particular way, or it doesn't come over. So I think that, you know, this you can see that there are kind of gamification principles. It's very highly colored, there's lots of flashing stuff going on, you know, so it's quite dynamic. Um, and it's quite fun, it's quite amusing, it's quite, you know, it's chronology in some way. But um, this, this idea of personality, well, you can disagree with me, but just keep it in mind. When you look at stuff, think to yourself, am I, what am I buying into? Is this just, I'm just doing this as a job, functionally, or on some sort of way, personal, build, buy into the personality. A lot of people buy Apple, or started to, used to buy Apple, because they, bought the, they wanted to buy the kind of Apple brand, the Apple personality. Okay, that it's cool, it's you know, shiny, it's sleek, it's fast, it's high-end, that kind of thing. So, think about those things, see whether you agree. Um, and then you've also got, remember, the UX.com.
Martin curve and also remember the, uh, the uh, flow diagram. So this is the flow diagram I'm trying to give this before now. Um, <coughs> we're going to go back to the coffee break because we've got 10 minutes on everybody back here at um, 11 o'clock sharp. Um, but let us just see if Notice how it's in there, how it breaks in, and this, this rule, it's just a big, long, scrolling page. You can see your HQ, just there. Ling is a baby. <laughs> baby Ling says, cheap car deals. Okay, so I'll let you guys play the stupid game if you want, or uh, do what you like. But back here, I'm just going to pick up our uh, guest. Uh, so, the rest of